Okay, so yeah, before we jump into the discussion, I'd just like to thank our speakers. We have Ryan. Ryan's the co-founder and CTO of Wisely. We have Jennifer Fila, CEO and founder of Prospect Research Institute, and also Marianne Pelletier, founder and managing director of Staupel Analytics Group. And the three of them have kindly joined us today. And as I said, this edition of the Founders Stream is particularly exciting because we have three founders joining us. And to the speakers, I'll let you introduce yourselves um, briefly before we get into the talk. So how about we can start with Ryan and then go with Jen and then go with Marion. I, uh, since we already did light introductions, why don't I say a little bit more about what Wisely does since it's kind of more relevant to the, the conversation here. So um, at Wisely, we very much consider ourselves an add-on to one of the more popular CRMs within the not-for-profit space, um, which is owned by Blackbaud. Uh, hopefully the folks who know the not-for-profit space are uh, uh, annoyed with us that we chose Blackbaud as the first one, but um, uh, one of the things that we found with uh, that was missing in Blackbaud was really uh, a focus on the fundraiser themselves. And we initially went into creating a product that would really help fundraisers understand the whole process behind um, actually bringing in a, a donation. Fundraisers, we like to, to think of them very similar to salespeople for the folks who don't know much about fundraising, um, in that they're very much people people. They, uh, they sell the mission of the organizations to, uh, to their donors rather than to someone who's buying a, a product. Uh, and we really felt that the products that they were using to help identify um, which donors they should really be spending their time on uh, were pretty old and outdated in a lot of cases. And a lot of what they were um, trying to get with data uh, was um, was really not helping them do their job um, as a as a fundraiser. So, as part of that, um, as part of the fundraising world, prospect research is is a big piece. And really, we try to um, work alongside those fundraising teams, whether you're a prospect researcher or a fundraiser, to really help you focus on what you do best, whether it's deeper prospect research or um, actually building relationships with uh, mid and major donors. Awesome, thanks Ryan and Jen. Great, I'm so glad you went first, Ryan. <laughs> you make my job easier. So I am not data focused per se. And as the Prospect Research Institute, my job is to help educate people in prospect research. The majority of nonprofits in the space um, struggle with just data entry. So uh, I kind of run or, or look at the whole spectrum of what they're doing. And at the Institute, one of the things that I'm really striving for is that it's not something you learn how to do in a webinar. So the courses give people that opportunity to struggle um, to struggle with concepts, to struggle with homework assignments, and to struggle at work and bring that with them to live meetings. So it's really a learning community. And that includes now some data analytics. And I've actually um, been working and partnering with Marianne. We're looking at doing some more of that really heavy data focused because with people like Ryan and Wisely coming on board, um, and the CRM's getting better. As information technology has been snowballing and making it easier for the users, things, there, ha, there are more nonprofits with data that they can use and they, they don't know how to use it. So that's, that's where I'm at with the Prospect Research Institute. So hi again, I'm Marianne. And yes, there are enough Canadians on the call that we would say Peltier. Um, so, um, and, um, the Stoppel Analytics Group was founded as an all about data firm. We do like to help Razor's Edge clients handle their Razor's Edge data. We do like to help develop dashboards. We do like to help our clients build screening data and interpret it when it comes back. Uh, we, as soon as they start saying research, we send them to Jen. Um, and we also teach um, analytics and that is how our partnership with Jen is working brilliantly. We teach the more technical data science pieces and Jen's um, excellent work on how to do capacity ratings and do basic research is, uh, uh, coincides nicely. Um, our focus is um, getting a, a nonprofit to spend less money and, and bring in more revenue by understanding um, what 
their prospects behavior chains are. So we don't just do major gifts models. We do, this is how this person got to major gifts from the start. And so that's the exciting stuff we're doing now. Um, so already I have to go look up recommender systems because that sounds like fun. That's going to help the annual fund get really cool. So I'm going to be hanging out with Amir the head. Awesome. That's great. Thanks for the intro. So now we can get to the discussion. So to the speakers, I'll be directing questions to one speaker initially, but please feel free to add your perspective because I think having all three of your perspectives on each problem and question that we discuss, that's what's going to make this session great. So I'd like to first spend a bit of time defining this problem. So I heard prospect research, I heard major gift officer, and I think the question that some of the people in the audience might be asking is what really is fundraising analytics used for and what is prospect research? So Jennifer, since your company is called Prospect Research Institute, I think it makes sense to start with you. So what is prospect research? Great, that's a great question. I'm gonna to try to give you an answer. And one of the things that you'll find is, and many of you are in the nonprofit space, fundraising uses a lot of words, but people define them very differently. And there's many synonyms. So it is, um, it is tricky and it's a great question to always ask, you know, what do you mean by that? Prospect research is one of those. I think of prospect research as the larger umbrella term. Uh, in our field, it's also interchangeable with many times prospect development. And I know that in the, the smaller nonprofit world, they don't know what prospect development is, so they call it prospect research. So there's, there's some discrepancies there. But prospect research started back in the library when you got your who's who book and you looked at the social calendar and things like that in the newspaper. And as information technology has grown, so have we. And we take, we gather the information, we synthesize the information, and we present it to the salesperson, essentially, the major gift officer. And because research is intensive manually by hand, um, it's usually reserved for major gifts because it's an expense. And then that major gift officer um, used to be just took the information and said, oh, okay, this is how I'm going to talk to the prospect. But as information technology has, is doing more of the gathering for us, Prospect researchers have taken more of a role of strategy. So we're liaisons with these major gift officers, these sales officers, and that's moved into prospect strategy, which is what you heard Ryan talking about. Like who's in my portfolio of prospects that I have to talk to? So we do some of that identification, whether we're using a tool or we're doing it ourselves, sorting and filtering or using predictive modeling or whatever we're doing. And then that, so there's that prospect management aspect. And then from there, there's the data analytics, the fundraising analytics, which often is not just major gifts, but all of the giving. So major gifts is one part of an overall development fundraising program. So you can have direct appeals, whether that's snail mail, social media, or digital, uh, you know, so there's all kinds of fundraising that goes on. Prospect research tends to be more focused in major gifts, but fundraising analytics can spread wider. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, think, yeah, it makes sense. Please, Marianne sorry, and Ryan, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I think that one of the things that you're alluding to, Jen, is what Joshua Burkholz refers to as field research. So the prospect research team or the prospect development team develops the prospect list. The gift officer goes and does the field research, which means does this person really have wealth, but also the other two pieces of fundraising, right? Affinity and inclination to give. Um, so affinity is do they like you? Inclination is do they, do they like to give at all? So yeah, so that, that piece, the research informs the gift officers, then the gift officers come back and inform research to make the profile more robust, I think is what I was hearing you talk about. That's the development piece. Ryan, did I fit you in there properly? It, yeah, it, it, it's interesting because I, I think um, of the of the three of us, I guess I my background is is actually more on the technical side and not from the not for profit and fundraising side. And uh, as a engineer, kind of coming in to this space, uh, what I found I, I was initially attracted more to the prospect research side because it's more uh, heavy on the the data, and, and it's just been interesting to um, 
kind of learn about all of the 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 different roles and really trying to think of with it like what's their equivalent in the business world versus the the not-for-profit world and really then trying to understand um, like where does all the the data come from how is all the the data used um, and at wisely we tr we try to break the the prospect research role down really into kind of two main parts we try to think of that that initial like heavy on the data analysis side, which you, you mentioned, um, and there are so many well established ways of breaking down that data um, that have been done for decades at, at this point. And we're getting to the point now where a lot of that data can be very quickly analyzed by large systems and there's a ton of data to manage it. Um, and that really frees up uh, if you start to automate some of that work, that really frees up the prospect researchers to do a little bit more of that heavy on the research side, um, where it focuses more on those individual donors and really gets into who they are. Um, that, that connection from the organization, from the not-for-profit to whoever the donor is, is really the most important connection. And when, when anyone gets involved in a not-for-profit, they are they're dedicating time, they're dedicating money, they're dedicating that, that focus to a not-for-profit, usually because there is some sort of personal connection. And a prospect researcher is going to spend time trying to identify that personal connection. So it's interesting to, to think about how that personal connection can start to come out in, uh, in data, at least. Interesting. So if I could put in a few words, it seems like prospect research is finding and identifying people who will be willing to make donations and understanding their backgrounds. Pretty much. Great. I'm glad. Making sure glad they have money to that. give. That's right. Yeah. The, okay. It, interesting. The wealth piece. Yeah. The wealth piece. Right. And, and so we call that capacity and we have capacity okay. ratings where we put people in the segments of wealth. Oh, okay. And we don't say net worth because we don't know anybody's debt, right? We just say what we see for wealth. Um, and lately, the data scientists have been trying to do it for the prospect researchers. So I've been very curious to see how that's starting to come out. In, oh, interesting. So that um, kind of segues into my next question. So I was wondering in particular, this prospect research problem, what makes it a hard problem? And I'd like to ask Marion, and I'm curious, so does this difficulty lie on the technical side or is it more a business problem that is difficult? Okay, so this is a great question that I love to answer, right? Because really, when you're a prospect researcher, right, when, when you know, you've done Jen's classes and you're like into it, you're really trying to play being John Malkovich. Remember that movie? You've got to get into the head of a wealthy person and you've got to see and feel how wealthy do they feel, right? Because, um, you know, when the stock market crashes, somebody's wealth can drop from 50 to 40 million, and that person feels desperately poor. And none of us have sympathy for that. How do we talk about that with them, right? But the other one is, what are they interested in, and how do we talk to them about it, right? And so that's the piece that um, Ryan is mentioning as well. What is the connection? How do we make the connection? Like we're calling, we try to systematize it, right? So we call them interest codes and, you know, giving patterns. I call it a behavior chain. What are the things that got that person closest to us, right? And those are all different disciplines in the field. So, um, so, so, so technic the technical piece of it is taking a huge number of records and bringing them down to a subset of the top 5% likely to make a gift of something like $100,000 over five years or a million over five years. The, the prospect research part is finding that one connection or that one piece of personal information or that one piece of business information that says that person is willing to speak to you and that person has the wealth. That's, that's what it looks like to me. Ryan, Jen, would you like to add any more details to that? Yeah, the um, it's interesting when we look at the the data from a from the technical side and hard problem. As um, as time goes on, we're just getting more and more data. Uh, if if you look at um, at some of the larger organizations, they may have decades of data at this point, and the more donors they get, the larger they grow, the harder that problem becomes to identify the right person to talk to. And uh, I think traditionally, um, not-for-profits have focused on, or at least one, one piece of not-for-profits have focused on really that, those major donors because they do frankly um, 
make the largest gifts, bring in most of the revenue for the organization. And that, that doesn't mean that someone who only donates $20 or $10 or $5 um, has no value to the organization because they can contribute in other ways as well. Um, but the, I think where maybe the, the three of us have been focusing is more around that relationship-based fundraising where um, there's enough value in a given donor to that organization that it is worth spending time, money, and effort um, into identifying that, that right person. And there definitely is a technical challenge there trying to identify, again, just in data, not knowing, not truly knowing who this person is, um, trying to identify where do you spend your limited time and resources. Uh, it becomes a business problem, uh, I think, for all of us once we have some of that data and we package that data in a different way, and then you're trying to bring it to someone internal to your organization, to a fundraiser, and say, here's the data, now now go and build that relationship. Um, and it's it's interesting to, to see how it transitions from that technical problem into a business problem. That's very interesting, and that brings up another question that I wanted to ask. So speaking about this business problem, and delivery of information. So I imagine this must be really important. And on our coordination call for this event, it was mentioned that sometimes these major gift officers, they might not be the most technical people. And of course, regardless of your technical background, people consume information in different ways. So I'm wondering how do you ensure that data is presented in the most digestible format? And also what is the best format in your experience to get buy-in from these major gift officers? And for this one, I'd like to start with Jennifer. Sure, yeah. Um, I think it comes as a surprise to a lot of researchers that have grown up in the field that handing over a spreadsheet of hundreds of names to essentially a salesperson who is really good at relationships probably isn't the best way to get them to adopt these new prospects into their portfolio. And yet, at the same time, I'm going to talk out of both sides of the mouth here, um, there are now people who it's a life skill to understand data. And so on the very high end, the fundraisers who are raising those millions oftentimes do have technical skills and they're going to question every bit of that rating <laughs> and they want to see all of that in a spreadsheet so that they can understand how you arrived at it and believe you and have that trust. So I, I think it depends on your listening better to your end user. Um, for someone like um, you, I'm thinking Ryan and, and Marianne, where you're sort of delivering these end products, I, I have to wonder how you deliver a user-friendly format um, to fit all. Because uh, sometimes it's that vice president who signs the contract, and it's really the, the major gift officer who is the user of the data that you're providing. When I do it, I tend to work with those who have less data and they tend to be even more challenged. So I put things in Word. <laughs> you know, I would never hand anybody a spreadsheet. Um, they need to see a little Word profile so that they can uh, assign it in a group and understand at a glance what somebody looks like. So I'd love to hear from like Marianne, what kind of product delivery you're making, who's your end user. Um, and the same with you, Ryan. There, I think you both work with different types of organizations in a different way. Yeah, I'd be happy to join in. I can actually show you an illustration of the kind of thing that you don't show a client and then something that does work better. If you'd like to see that. That would be great. Okay. So this is, uh, can you see the PowerPoint slide? Yes, we can see it. Okay. So this is a PowerPoint slide that recommend, rec uh, this is a behavior chain and every marine Sorry, market. do you mind uh, going full screen because it's hard to Not see at all. It. Not at all, not at all. Better? Or did I go full screen? Yep, that looks great. Okay. Uh, I'm always nervous about what I'm sharing in Zoom. But anyway, if we have uh, all these uh, maroon hash marks is a person making a gift, and yellow is an assignment to a gift officer, and the asterisks are $100,000 gifts, and there are other behaviors that are just not shown in this particular set of data, including emails and letters and stuff. Well, I showed this to the project lead and he was very interested. But you can imagine that the gift officers and the vice president who came from the gift officer pool just went into a coma right then, right? But the, when we take a look at, uh, let me show you something else if you don't mind. When we take a look at 
Um, and I will put it up at the slideshow. So we had to make it very colorful. But what we're saying is, um, you know, these are the these are the behaviors that says what increases engagement, what decreases engagement. How do we get there? And so this is very colorful and cartoony at first. So it keeps people interest long enough for me to start explaining. These are the, the behaviors that get in, increased engagement. These are the behaviors that say that they're more engaged. These are the behaviors that say that they're going to join us. But we have to solve, we have to mention one problem at a time. So one of the slides that I have um, is, you know, eight visits and you're done. And I show the, you know, the drop off where it's like after that, you're not making gifts. And that's the thing we have to show. The clients most of the time will say, just show me a person to look at. So we also bring up a sample person. And that's, and, and that's what uh, I think Jen and, and even Ryan are saying is that, you know, this is all very nice that you use these big fancy software and you did these things that you're not gonna explain to me, but unless I see an example of a person that gets me all excited, I'm not interested. And so that, the, what Jen was describing is show me the list or write these people out. What we, we have is um, a, a prospect, uh, we, what, we, what we're trying to develop with clients is essentially a, um, uh, oh goodness, a prospect scorecard where we say, here's the prospect's ID, here's their, you know, so a little bit of giving data, here's their capacity data, their prospect research and their interests, and then what you're likely to see from them. And I could, I could look for that while, while Ryan talks about how he solves his problem. <laughs> I think what you're also hearing here is that you could probably ask this same question to anyone, whether you're someone who has data and you're delivering data or whether you're someone who's receiving data in that, yes. how do you want to see that? And you're probably going to get a different answer for every single person. And that it really is the, the challenge. Uh, I mean, when you're talking about founding an organization, trying to figure out how do you deliver your service? How do you deliver your product? How do you design your product? That is one of the more common problems that you have to deal with. Usually you have solved or have a, a good idea of how to solve kind of the core problem, but how do you actually make it successful? How do you actually deliver it? It really is the challenge. Um, this was really where Wisely came from, really focusing on how do we deliver that data when we started, we're not a we're not an old company. We're uh, we were founded in 2017, and at that point, you you had very large analytics um, companies whose sole purpose was to process a bunch of data and deliver a, a bunch of data to organizations. And our focus, really coming in, was to go to the fundraisers and say, "Are you actually using this data? How do you use this data?" I, I'm imagining that you're not looking at the spreadsheet. I'm imagining that you're not looking at this massive list of, of people to figure out like what would actually be helpful here. Um, and we try to focus as much as we have a ton of data, we try to focus on what really is the most important piece of information that you need right now. Um, and going, uh, going so far as to say, well, look, we're only going to show you this piece of information and we know you need more and you can go to your CRM to find more. You can go to your analytics reports to find more, but right now this is the only thing that you need. And then it goes into that and now trust us. Uh, and that brings up a whole nother conversation of how to actually develop trust in the way that you're actually showing someone that, that piece of information. I agree that, so this is the, this is the crux of the dilemma, right? So if you ever, go to a horse race, right, and you buy the program, there is so much information about that horse, right down to like the color of the horse and what the horse weighed last time. And, and so, um, but there's a, an episode of, I think it's Freakonomics or I think it was Freakonomics where they talk about a person can really only pay attention to eight variables at a time. So now what, right? And the, the point of the programs was, oh, you want more data on horses? Here's more data on horses. But then the people who have never been racing before, like a gift officer who's never looked at data like that before, would would just, you know, oh, that's a pretty name, you know? And I'm not saying that's what gift officers do, but they're like, they're used to looking for their own paradigms. What's the past giving history? Um, show me some wealth. Oh, he has a, he's the brother of the person that hates us, you know, and that, and that it becomes a very personal thing. And the other thing that you're saying, Ryan, is that the, um, we don't explain how we find them, and that's the trust me problem. Right, and because I've, I've, 
I, the largest gift I've ever asked for was $4,000. So who am I to walk in and tell these people, go ask that person for 5 million? It's very interesting. It seems like the role of, I mean, the role that the three of you take on is really to empower these gift officers to find these prospects and form these relationships with these prospects. And I'm curious, so before we get into more technical details and touch on some machine learning and data, Ryan, I'm curious so about your more, I'm curious more about your work at Wisely. So where do you draw the line then between completely automating prospect research for these fundraising organizations, therefore automating and getting rid of, in a sense, these gift officers jobs, which is a fear that a lot of people have, I know. Um, so automating prospect research versus using your AI platform as a, an, an empowerment tool, which seems to be what you're doing right now. So I'm curious about how you feel about this trade off. Yeah, the the focus for us at Wisely, and I think for for almost anyone talking kind of at that that for the larger gifts, really it does come down to understanding how to give the information in a meaningful way and how to actually empower the fundraiser. I think it's uh, you, you often hear like, oh, AI is going to kind of replace a bunch of jobs and just automate everything, and in many cases that's true, but this is really one case where even if you could automate it, you shouldn't automate it. Um, our goal is not to replace a fundraiser. A fundraiser is the organization's personal, professional personal connection to their donors and the people who help that organization continue to run and, and deliver its mission. And you should not want to automate that. And that really is our, our focus. We want to work with those fundraisers and make their job easier because they're so good at building relationships. Um, that's why they're in the role that they're in. They're going to bring in more donors and make and find those passionate donors so that the mission can be achieved better and faster. And so our job is to make them do that faster. Um, our job is to accelerate that. It's not to replace that. And there is absolutely a place for automation. Uh, I mentioned earlier, like the, the five, 10, $20 donations and those types of transactional donations um, where you're, you're creating touch points, where you're creating awareness, where you're trying to create some sort of recurring transaction um, happening more at, at a, a large scale rather than a, the, the few, like the handful of people donating a, a million or $5 million gift. Um, there is definitely a place for automation there. And I think it really is that understanding of how, um, how, what should be automated, at what scale should it be automated, and really what is the organization trying to achieve. And, and that's really why I'd bring it back to the fundraiser um, with trying to achieve their mission and, and trying to empower their donors. If I could just add to that, I, as, the, as the business person, um, you know, using data sources, using data tools, you know, I, I feel like I wanna say, I have this dream <laughs> that we would treat our donors like some of the companies already treat us, you know, as individuals. Because it, when you have someone who is a billionaire, you simply are not gonna automate that at, at any level. Like that's just not smart. Um, but there's a whole lot of people underneath that where it makes a lot of sense to automate at least part of that relationship in a meaningful way. So if I'm on your website and I'm looking at these particular news stories, why wouldn't you let me log into my own account so I could print my tax receipts or whatever else and also provide me with ideas on what other funds I might be interested in? Like other people, other donors like you give to, you know, whatever and really create this. We are used to having virtual personas that are as real. You know, we, some of our Facebook friends perhaps or Twitter friends are just as real to us, even though we don't see them face to face. And we can create that, companies do. Um, and I, if, if machine learning could do anything, if it could connect us with donors in a larger scale, I think that would be truly disruptive and remarkable and fabulous. Um, I, I agree, absolutely. Um, that uh, an annual fund, if I'm on the website, it's like, you know, hey, if you were busy looking at what kind of bird was in your backyard, other people like you used to give to this. Well, that's Amazon, right? That's the Amazon model. And Netflix, 93%, you know, this, this movie is 93% likely to be of interest to you. Well, how about this fund, right? And 
So what people used to do by hand when they were writing me notes back, you know, hey, and yeah, we, we named the lab after your favorite professor. It can ha it's and it's actually Andy Rear tried to build that with a toolkit that he had. Um, and Gravity is trying to do that with the, you know, construct the email that is of interest to the gift of, to the prospect. But and I also I also recognize that there's just no way we can have a, a robo phoner thing call and say, press one to give a million dollars, you know, because it isn't going to work. You have to have a person for that. And I can't tell you where the cutoff is because every nonprofit has different points. It's interesting when you mention, or I think all three of you mentioned this sort of idea of recommending um, if you donated to X, you might like to donate to Y. And to me, that definitely screams recommender systems. So I definitely like to ask more about that. But first of all, I'm curious about hearing more about the data that you have access to in your organization. So the scale of it and also just the shape of it. And I was wondering if we could start with Marion for this question and then hear also from Ryan and Jen afterwards. So uh, the, the, the data that's stored in the CRM uh, certainly includes demographic information. The cleanest data is the um, gift data because that has to go through an audit, right? So it has to be, this is the gift amount. This is the fund it was given to. Uh, we no longer store credit cards and, and check numbers and stuff. Um, and then uh, sometimes a person will tell us where they work, especially if it's an alumni association. Um, we also have uh, screening companies that aggregate publicly known information. If you are in Canada, it's a lot harder to do this. Uh, the United States, we brag about everything. Um, but in uh, Canada, uh, you have great privacy laws, right? So, um, uh, but it, you would look at iWave for some help there. Um, so, but that says things like, you know, Marianne tends to own a, Marianne owns a Citgo card and um, she's a Democrat and she, you know, has two people in her house or something. So it would go on about, it would give us that information as well. Um, that's of course extra money, right? But um, uh, uh, the other thing is uh, what, what events did I go to? Um, and if, I, if a gift officer went and came and visited me, then the gift officer of course was diligent and wrote a very good contact report. I would lean on Jen to really fill out the rest of the <laughs> When um, my experience as a consultant is traditionally with the nonprofit, so human services, arts, uh, environment, science, as opposed to academic. So in higher education and healthcare, there are just, I mean, they have data warehouses, right? So there's just m many years uh, and just large volume of data and all kinds of data points. So um, in the nonprofit where I work, they tend to have giving data, almost end of story. And even there, they're, they're going to have a really hard time just giving me um, a download file of their giving data. So the, it's a real struggle um, to access the data, which is why I hope that the CRM get better at giving them analytics just baked into their CRMs, because that would, again, tremendous value for the end user. So they struggle to get it out. They may have only started recording that data five years ago, 10 years ago. So you're talking about very little data for analytics on a typical consulting client for me. And when they get something like a wealth screening, I have to take that information and really translate it to them into English, which I mean, it's just so far beyond the technical stuff that you work with in machine learning. It's just um, amazing to me, but that's a very real and very large population of potential nonprofit customers that, that really has very little data and it has um, very little understanding of how to use it and sometimes even not the sophisticated level of fundraising experience to build those connections. So there's a wide spectrum. This is why a startup will start with higher education and healthcare because they have too much data and they have staff to manage it. They have IT, they have prospect research, they have prospect management. They might even have some analytics staff to work with a Ryan or a Marianne to build what money. works for them. Sorry, and they have money. 
They have money to do it. Yeah. So they, they can try something new and they're willing to invest in that over a period of time, even though it's new. Whereas a small nonprofit, I mean, they're, um, they're usually pretty bare bones. They can spend, but only after you prove that it's really going to work for them. Yeah, that, very interesting. Yeah. I'd love to hear from Ryan as well, too. Yeah, I, I think that, as Jen was saying, that maturity or kind of his, like length, um, how how long they've they've been around, the length of time an organization has been there, really starts to define how much data they have and how mature their data is. Um, lots of uh, larger nonprofits are on Blackbuds Raises Edge, um, and so our primarily our clients are there at the kind of big end of the scale. So I'll, I'll get a little bit more technical details for, for the uh, machine learning and data science folks on the, the call, um, just in terms of understanding the, the type of data structure of data and size of data. So a single organization at the large end might have um, upwards of 10 million GIFs, individual gift records, complete transaction information, date and amount and stuff like that. Uh, they will probably have uh, a million donors. Um, you start to get into very, uh, very detailed, personally identifiable information, both in terms of who they are, where they live, who they're connected to, their entire family. You start to get into their their income, uh, their wealth, their assets, um, especially in the States, as Marianne was saying, that you get a lot of information. And then you also get the, the information about their relationship with the organization themselves. If you imagine that um, for a, a major donor, they've been involved, they've been donating to this organization for quite some time, they might have re received dozens or hundreds of emails and phone calls, been to a bunch of different uh, events, donated in different ways, uh, brought in other people to the organization, and all of that data um, for a more mature organization is tracked. And so you really can get a very detailed picture of certain individuals. Now, obviously on the, the small scale, you, you have um, individuals who might've only made a small gift or only just attended an event and you might get some information, um, but you really are talking about uh, um, just that, that very detailed piece of information for every individual. Um, at, at Wisely, as I said, the large organizations might have 10 million gifts. Those gifts might span back decades, 30 or 40 years in some cases. Um, so you very quickly working with a handful of organizations, you're starting to get into the uh, the, the tens or hundreds of millions of, of data points. Um, for Blackbud themselves, if you can imagine that they they have around 40,000 not-for-profits, and these are the like 40,000 of probably the most mature not-for-profits, they have absolutely billions of, of data points and records on individuals. And uh, you can start to think of the interesting things that you could do with that information. Yeah, and speaking of training models, so Ryan, I'm curious when you are training your models, are you training them independently on each customer or do you mix all the customer's data together? Do you maybe segment first and then train several models? Yeah, so um, Wisely has uh, kind of two different models. I'll, I'll speak about both and, and more to say that, that we're, we are maturing as an organization as our technology does as well. So when Wisely first started, um, because we were dealing with structured data and as much as um, we have access to uh, to some, uh, like we've got emails, for example, of uh, that we could use some NLP on, uh, the more interesting information is all structured data and the, the traditional guidance within the well, traditional within the last few years uh, within the machine learning space is when you've got that type of structured data um, don't do any crazy neural nets don't go on the deep learning side really just use um, some linear regression algorithms and they're good enough and, and frankly they are good enough in, in a lot of cases and um, so early versions of, of Wisely where we focus um, on a very pr few particular models like specifically who's going to give a, the date that, that we think their next gift is going to come in and, and how much that next gift is going to be, for example. Um, we relied just on an XGBoost model. And um, because of the uh, training scale there and because of the amount of data, um, we went on a per organization basis for a couple of reasons. One, the, the scale that I, I mentioned there, but also, and we didn't talk too much about bias yet, but um, in many cases, the organizations that you're dealing with here are trying to reach out to 
a very narrow criteria of donors and ignoring like uh, the traditional bias in terms of gender or race or anything like that, which is, is an issue, but more in terms of like, where do they live, the types of jobs they might have, how they might be connected to the organization. Uh, and so you're really trying to, to pick out a few of those individuals in the, the hundreds of thousands or million um, donors that they might already have. And in those cases, we really wanted to tailor our models to every single organization. So at wisely as as it existed um, was kind of built on a per organization basis. When we worked with a new organization, um, we expected that they would have a certain amount of data. And so again, we only worked with the larger organizations that could also pay for these types of tools and dedicated training on models. But what that's now enabled us to do is um, at the scale of data that we now have, we are actually transitioning all of our underlying architecture over to TensorFlow, uh, TensorFlow 2.0 specifically, and rebuilding the, those same models, very little difference in terms of the types of data, the types of features, the types of predictions that they're making. But now with the scale that we have, um, we can actually start to build a more global model for, uh, for all of our organizations and that still maintains some of that bias because we can train a global model and, and kind of optimize it on an individual organization afterwards if we've identified that bias. Um, but we can, what we can also now start doing is working with much smaller organizations who would in the past would frankly never have access to these types of tools because they're just so expensive. So that's really where we want to drive wisely. There's a ton of organizations, not just the biggest of the big that are gonna get a lot of value out of analytics and, and tools like this. And now we can actually offer that to them. So uh, it, it's interesting for us to see that, that transition from individual models to now more global models. Yeah, thanks so much for that answer. Definitely very interesting to hear more technical details and global model versus individual model, all very interesting. I'm wondering, um, Jen and Marion, do you have any points you would like to add in terms of um, bias that Ryan mentioned and maybe also data and mixing customers data? So, you know, I heard your question a little differently, um, but the, my first reaction to Ryan's comment about mixing customer data is that we sign contracts that say we're going to give them all back all their data or we'll destroy it. So. Uh, we're not about to mix it, but what wisely is what I'm hearing wisely is doing is what Lawrence Henze was doing in the 90s, putting enough data together from different clients that he could start saying, these are the things that make a major gift prospect and a planned gift prospect. The planned gift stuff, paradigms are the paradigms we still use today. So I think that's, I think that's fascinating and I want to see how that, I want to see how that unfolds. Um, everybody says, can you tell me what everybody else says, but no, you can't have my data. So I'm gonna, I'm, I'm especially curious, but your question, what I heard from your question was when you see data, do you just do one run for the whole constituency? And so then that becomes the question, the next question, right? And I remember at a, at a, a data mining and modeling conference, walking up to one of the speakers and saying, I've been doing baseball and it comes out that one variable is an independent variable, it's the pitcher. And he said, well, if that is so strong a variable, you have to split by the pitcher split your model and come up with different models. And we developed a recent partnership with Lytix and uh, we did a beta test for a client and we came up with four segments that don't, you know, the prospect didn't give. The prospect gave uh, this amount, but not that amount the next year. The prospect is a higher end donor and then the prospect is kind of confusing, you know? Um, and so we kind of, we, we then built models on four, we had four different models um, on four different segments and they, we use different machine learning tools to understand each one, like somebody got random forest and another segment got linear regression and another segment got logistic. But so translating all of this as rules to the client is going to be, you know, quite a project because the client is in Salesforce and has to write SQL code. But it did get a lot more precise at saying this particular prospect who gave you a hundred dollars will give you a thousand if you ask. And that's the exciting piece for us. Mary, and one comment I'll make since uh, since you brought it up, uh, and, and frankly, it's a good question that that understanding of mixing customer data. Um, customer data is the most important thing. I mentioned earlier how much personally identifiable information you have, and really, organizations are worried about their data, and and they don't want you mixing your data or their data with other customers' data. And we take that same approach at Wisely. We treat customers' data as their data if they they leave 
if they take all of their data with them. We don't store any of that. Uh, there are cases where we yeah. might ask to keep it for training purposes, but um, we generally, or for analysis purposes, but generally it's their data. And the initial versions of the models that I mentioned, this is the limitation of those old, older linear regression models, where if you actually look at the output of that model, it actually has like, details like actual pieces of the the data that you fed into the model and mm -hmm. we couldn't make that public before we couldn't uh, keep those models around because we are storing the data even if we deleted the the source data the nice right. thing about actually going into the the neural network side of things the deep learning side of things is that you can actually build models that don't retain that that information and that it can be anonymized and so the initial model that that we can build even if a customer leaves we can take the benefit of having learned from their data without mm -hmm. actually now keeping their data around. And so um, maintaining that privacy, we actually have the ability to, I won't go too far in the, tech, the technical piece here, but actually building what's called a federated model, where you can imagine built, training a, a mini version of model on organization one and organization two and organization three, and then having that global model learn from those pieces without actually sharing the data together and that's that really is the the advancement in the technology and how quickly it, it's happening that now you can actually start to maintain privacy but still get the benefit of some of those higher order systems. so you're doing you're doing ensemble modeling but your ensembles are complete neural net models this is really cool yeah uh, yeah the technology has so, progressed yeah. quite far yeah uh, so our our my favorite software right now is ibm modeler so i am able to take a neural net model and apply it to another data set. But like you mentioned, if the if one of the variables, the independent variables, is, you know, is a graduate, graduate of the University of Ontario, and I'm looking at um, you know, a different university, I've got a problem. So yeah, so okay, so I really I'm I'm looking forward to hearing more and I, I hope the audience is too. Mm -hmm. Maybe we're gonna have cool. to put Marion and Ryan in a breakout room together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, last sure question before we move on is actually just a question for Jen. Jen, did you have any comments about what we last talked about? Otherwise, we can move into the breakout session, but I want to leave space for you to comment as well. Oh, thanks. Yeah, just um, what I've been working on lately, and I'm curious how machine learning and, and analytics can address it, but um, inclusivity. So we miss a lot of great donors because they don't have the traditional hallmarks that we use in our sort of wealth screening, public data matching. And um, that includes all minorities. So I do a lot of deeper research to uncover those folks, and that's very expensive. So if there was a way to recognize that, also that for many organizations, their next transformational donor, their next you know, 140 million or whatever it is that's transformational, comes from the outside. So it's not a captive constituency like their alum, perhaps, or um, it, there may even be a tenuous connection. So that's another aspect, you know, when you don't have those people sitting in there. But I think there are definitely ways to uh, expand once you get that going past the donor information. That's great. In other, so, in oh, other words, there's sorry, a lot of opportunity for people to create more. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So I just want to say thank you so much to our speakers. It was very interesting. I definitely learned a lot. Didn't know much about prospect research or fundraising. It's fascinating to hear about the data you have, the business problem itself, and in particular, I find it interesting how it sort of it's, it starts with a technical problem and really truly becomes a business problem at the very end because you do have to, at the end of the day, interact with a person.